Well, welcome uh, everyone who's here and uh, watching online this session on uh, uniting Europe's markets. And we are focusing particularly on uniting Europe's capital market, though I think there'll be other aspects that we'll touch on. I mean, it's very striking. I was commenting to some of the other speakers. I have a feeling of deja vu around this. I'm sure I have done just such a panel on a, on a similar set of challenges around capital market union at some point in the last few years. You know, the, the European Union has achieved extraordinary things in the last 15 years or so. But if there's one major project that, if anything, has gone backwards in that time, it is the development of a truly European capital market. You know, the free movement of capital was actually mentioned in the Treaty of Rome and the Capital Market Union project was formally launched. It'll be 10 years ago this July. And yet, financial integration in Europe is lower than it was before the global financial crisis. And the Europe's bond markets and venture capital are all dwarfed in scale um, by the US. So we're going to be trying to kind of tease out, I think, not just sort of uh, moaning about you know, why we haven't got here, but also uh, you know, are they, what are the key obstacles? Where could progress be made? We may also mention whether, whether it should be the top priority, whether actually there are bigger things to do to do with the single market. Um, but anyway, we have, we have people sitting on lots of different sides of this. Christine Lagarde, obviously European Central Bank President. Pascal Donoghue, Eurogroup President and Expenditure Minister in Ireland. Christian Seving, uh, the Deutsche Bank CEO. Uh, Rolof Botha, uh, who's the managing partner for Europe and the US for Sokoya, and Nadia Calvino, uh, the European Investment Bank president. So thank you very much to all of you. Madame Lagarde, I must uh, start with you. Uh, you know, we have been talking about this for a really long time. Yep. Why do you think the progress has been too slow? And I guess also, what, what for you, what would be the single priority that we could press on in, in the 10-year the anniversary of this project? Well, good afternoon to everyone. And Stephanie, you're right. It, it has been a recurring topic uh, for many of us, and spe especially those of us who work on, on European integration. I think uh, Jean-Claude Juncker was the one who, pined, who sort of made that one of his uh, key projects, and that was already a long time ago. And s a few things have changed, uh, but it hasn't progressed much. And as you said, financial integration, if anything, has uh, been reduced over the course of the last few years. So why do I think that we should really mobilize our energies? And why do I think that all of us around this uh, panel are convinced that we can actually make progress? And you have to not blame anybody, uh, not try to nitpick and, and finger point, um, but ask yourself whether there is a valid business case and an opportunity to actually take it further. And then what you need to do is to look at history and the circumstances during which very large capital markets, such as the US, very large capital markets, such as the UK, why did they develop? And were there circumstances that justified it at the time that could be taking place now? And that's what I think, personally. So when you look back at the US, the capital market developed massively as a result of the development of the railroad across the country. Mm. If you look at, at numbers, it was late 19th century, but the takeoff, the takeoff was clearly associated with railroad development. And there was bond emissions, most of, not all, most of it, but a large part of which was subscribed by foreigners. Mm. The same happens with the UK and the municipal capital market grew to about half the size of the government debt market. I want to make it very uh, specific. And it was related to urbanization and the development of building roads, sewers, gas works, and all the rest of it. So what does that have to do with our current circumstances? Plenty of railroads, plenty of sewers uh, and infrastructure. But what we have in front of us now is what I call the DDDDD one of which is decarbonization, one of which is digitalization. And if I'm to believe the numbers uh, provided by the European Commission, and I have no reason to doubt them, although they tend to increase over the course of time, it will cost no less than 620 billion per year to actually 
move the green transition further into the hope of a clean energy environment and a serious reduction of our CO2 emission. And it will cost 120 billion per year as well to develop the digitalization that we need. So if you put these two numbers together, I'll leave it to it. Do we have the money? No. Public? Not enough fiscal space for that. Banks? I'm sure that Christian will say that, yes, they can carry some of it, but it's not enough. So I contend that there is actually a set of circumstances that could fully justify that we go over the many hurdles that we have faced and that still exist in order to put in place a capital market. And I would be happy to expand on what we should do, what method we should use, because I have some views on that, having gone through 15 years of trial and errors, failing uh, to, to achieve the ultimate results. And I think that artificial intelligence can help. So Pascal Donahue, you are head of the Euro Group. Christine has, has very uh, admirably kind of placed this on the economics, the economic case for capital market union. You've stated it as a sort of priority for the group. How are you going to pursue that in the next year? So if I could give the uh, uh, political side of the coin uh, that Christine has described very clearly uh, when she described the economics of it. So politically, as a finance minister working with other finance ministers in the Eurogroup, uh, so much of our effort, so much of our focus has firstly been on budgetary matters, where finance ministers spend 95% of their time looking at how much they're taxing, how much they're spending and how much they are borrowing. Uh, what little time has been available uh, from dealing with those weighty matters over the many difficulties of the last years, was then devoted to banking issues, to banking union, during the global financial crisis, and in the aftermath of the financial crisis, building up and supporting our institutions, and making all of the changes that were needed, the benefits of which I think we've seen in recent years. And I would contend, actually, that an opportunity cost, and a justified opportunity cost, has been the political focus on the need to build and deepen our capital markets uh, has not been what it could have been because other priorities needed time and needed economic and political capital. The reason that is now changing is exactly for the reason uh, that uh, Christine has just outlined there. What she summed up very, very clearly is we think about capital differently at moments of economic transition and we are clearly at multiple moments of economic transition exactly at the moment that finance ministers need to normalise budget policy and reduce borrowing. And this has brought to the fore the issue that we are discussing here today in terms of what change could look like from a process point of view, and I won't go into it too much because process rarely makes compelling uh, content. Um, They're fine. already here, I mean, you know. Well, still, I want to keep the audience in the room, uh, but I'll still sum it up quickly. Um, Prime Ministers last March in the European Council asked finance ministers to look at this project. We've been engaged in a number of different processes in looking at us, and it's now going to conclude in March, where we are going to say to the Commission, and to the next Commission in particular, these are the areas that we want you to consider, we want you to act upon, and we believe as a group of finance ministers we can make progress on these matters quickly. And just as the President outlined the different Ds there, Ds of the changes that are happening, I think there's an ABC that we need to be aware of. What's the architecture of capital markets? How can we change it? And if we change it, what's the B of what it can mean to a business? And what's the C, critically, as a politician, of what it can mean to citizens? And that's the areas that we want to make further progress on, on top of the gradual and important change that the Commission have been making, and they have been, but we're all conscious that we have to do more now in the time ahead. So, Christian Saving, you're sitting there at Deutsche Bank. Does your heart leap when you hear that this is now going to be a priority? <laughs> uh, do you see... I mean, is this something that is ex it remotely exciting to you or actually just not a big deal for your business? 
Well, it's super exciting for me, and, 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 and I mean, if you have followed me for the last five years, I think um, I'm, I'm one of the biggest um, pushers and fans of the European Capital Markets Union, and um, for for a couple of reasons. Number one, Christine and, and, and Pascal both said it. I think we are coming into an era over the next ten years, and, and forget about the banks from a corporate industry, where operating expenditure is, so to say, replaced by a priority by capital expenditures. The number of investments which corporates have to do in Europe in order to be in the game, in competition, from a digital, from a sustainability ESG point of view, is tremendous. And, and, and I think those companies who are investing will be successful. Those companies who are not following on AI and ESG will not be there anymore in 10 or 15 years. And therefore, the, the necessity to invest is huge. We can't do it, as Christine is saying, even if I would love to do it. And I think, by the way, um, the European banks have done a tremendous job in cleaning up, being robust, healthy, sustainable, profitable. Mm -hmm. The numbers Christine just mentioned are impossible <coughs> to stem for us. Today, unfortunately, 70% of the financing of the German Mittelstand is done via bank loans. In the US, it's actually 25 or 30%. The rest is coming from the capital markets. If you now think about how much investments will be necessary in the next years, the bank balance sheets, as robust as they are, will not be sufficient. And we also talked about the public finances. doesn't work. And therefore, we definitely need the European Capital Markets Union. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I'm, I'm really, I think, the one who is again and again saying we need to make progress. Now, two things to this. Number one, I think we need to do a better job, including the banks, explaining why we need these capital markets. I think that in particular in Europe, in my home country, there is also from the society point of view still a kind of a distrust in capital markets. And that may go back to the 2008 financial crisis. And we can criticize it, but it doesn't help. We need to do a better job in explaining why it is actually necessary for keeping the wealth and the prosperous situation which we have in Europe. And I think this is one thing, it's education of the people why it's so necessary in order to get Europe uh, competitive and uh, let it stay competitive. And the next item is, and, and I'm sure um, our partner to the left will, will talk about that. When we think about European capital markets, we think about kind of the deep markets for um, whether it's equity issuances, whether it's bond issuance. But usually, if you get a deep capital market, then the side arms are coming. And what I mean with side arms is venture capital, private equity. Other people, other players are coming to, to the game. And this is, again, necessary in order to finance new technologies, new emerging industries which are coming. And therefore, I think we also need to see the Capital Markets Union not only as the financing pot for traditional industries, but actually as our chance to attract new industries like the tech industry into Europe. We have the talent. We have the, we, we have the excellence. If you look at uh, uh, industrial AI, some German companies, European companies, are leading in the world. But we also need then the underlying financing. And therefore, my heart is leaping if I hear that. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah. uh, Nadia Calvino, I guess we can add you to the list of people that also, or the European Investment Bank, also can't afford to finance all of the things that have been talked about. But what, what role can, can the European Investment Bank play? Yes, two thoughts uh, from my side to complement what already has been shared. And I, let me start where you, where you started yourself, which is this feeling of déjà vu. Now, I was responsible for financial regulation uh, around the, the euro crisis. I left it in 2014. And by the time we already had the clear diagnosis that capital market union was a top priority and that we needed to move as fast as possible in this direction, 10 years later, we are still discussing, you know, and, and um, uh, despite the fact that I, I always uh, agree with, with Pascal, I think that uh, we can uh, spend a, years discussing what the ABC is, and maybe it's going to be more difficult to reach an agreement on that. Uh, so my uh, approach to this would be, let's do it. Let's start somewhere, you know, and find some low-hanging fruit or some realistic element on which to start. It can be a market, it can be an instrument. I will, I will come back to this in a second. 
but an additional reason to, to Christine's, uh, to why we absolutely need it, is that for the climate transition, we need scale. So we have the technologies, we have wonderful startups and companies that have developed the technologies that are going to allow Europe to succeed, to rise up to the challenge, and we will and we can do it, but we need scale. And so it's not only a matter of capital markets union, it's also a market of integration of our markets and making Europe have the sufficient scale for this to become profitable and to become affordable. Because as Pascal said, these new technologies cannot be only for rich citizens or for wealthiest states. You know, this, this uh, transition needs to reach the whole world. Uh, and so I think that it is, it, it is uh, of the essence and it's urgent that we actually proceed with this. And this brings me to my second point, which is what can the EIB do? And as you know, the EIB has, uh, I think, been very successful in becoming the climate bank. We uh, fixed ourselves a target of 50% of our business in climate finance. We outperformed this uh, target, not only in the bank, but as a group, together with the European Investment Fund. Actually, I can tell you, I mean, we will be uh, disclosing the 2023 results uh, next week in detail, but I can already tell you, we've made 49 billion euros in green investment in 23, up from uh, 38 the previous year. So, you know, the progression is, I think, uh, outstanding. It is impressive. Mm -hmm. And we were also pioneers uh, since 2007 issuing uh, climate awareness bonds you know this is the this is the pioneer instrument of, of climate bonds and green bonds uh, why don't we start there why don't we try to find an area a market where we have the taxonomy Europe is in the lead in developing these uh, new instruments and green finance. There's a strong political commitment to the climate transition. And I think the EIB should indeed play its role in being a catalyst, uh, de-risking investments, supporting financial uh, sector, also you know, uh, taking on new instruments and trying to explore new financial engineering instruments that can allow us to fund the necessary investments and mobilizing public and private partnerships, which I think are going to be necessary if we are to succeed, which we will. Thank you. Rulof uh, Bota, you're sort of sort of smiling at the end, and um, I'm sure you're very polite anyway, but you look like you're being particularly polite when you sort of have this feeling that a lot of what people have just talked about is completely irrelevant to you. I mean, this is partly, this project is partly about having more sequoias, sort of deeper sources of venture capital as well as other sorts of financing in Europe. And I don't get the sense that any of this would sort of fundamentally change the way you think about Europe. But maybe, am I completely wrong there? Uh, that's mixed. Firstly, thank you very much for having me here. I feel it's an honor to be uh, invited here today. You know, at Sequoia, we back founders that build early stage companies. Uh, and over the years, we've backed Apple, Oracle, Cisco, uh, NVIDIA, Google, PayPal, YouTube, Instagram, WhatsApp, the list goes on. So the companies we back today account for 27% of the NASDAQ when they were private companies. So we operate in a very different part of the universe. And candidly, I'm kind of daunted with the challenge that you face because we deploy small amounts of money in founders who have a dream to build for the future. But I feel that in our business, money follows the opportunities. And so we've been active in Europe for over a decade. Uh, I remember in 2010, May 2010, I was introduced to a young company in Copenhagen called Unity. There were 30 people in the company, and I hopped on a plane and I flew to Copenhagen immediately. And we made an investment in that company, and today it's a global winner. They have two billion in revenue, it's a big public company. Uh, we did that with UiPath in Romania. So from my point of view, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity in Europe, and we've, we now have people on the ground in Europe looking for opportunities. Last year, 11 of our 44 investments were in Europe, uh, we have an, a fantastic investment in a company called Robco in Germany, uh, building robotic solutions. Penny Lane is a software company in Paris. We have an early stage AI company called Dust that's also based in Paris. So I see tremendous opportunity from the bottom up with founders who want to build for the future. And hopefully that becomes a driver of economic growth. But is Europe, just to go back, is Europe already a single market as far as you're concerned? I mean, is that, what, are, what are the, do you face any obstacles? From our narrow point of view, from a capital market point of view, it, it really is the same because we can hop on a plane and go anywhere and make an investment. The challenges are more from an operating point of view where 
you know, what the founders tell us is they want easy access to deep pools of talent. Mm. So Penny Lane wants to concentrate all the best talent it can in Paris from wherever. Uh, they want predictable and consistent regulations. And they obviously want a large market opportunity. But I'll say the other thing that's changed about European founders, by the way, part of the reason we're so enthusiastic about being here is that they have global ambitions. I'll be honest, when I first traveled to Europe 20 years ago, I felt that founders here were aiming for small exits. They, they were happy with an acquisition. And now they really dream big. Mm -hmm. Your phrase, money follows opportunity, rather than um, the other way around. Did I go the way around? Yes. Uh, <laughs> it just makes you... I mean, does, are we focusing on the wrong things? I don't know who wants to take it up. But, but you know, uh, Pascal... Should we be thinking more concretely about the opportunities in the broader economy and let the money come to it? But that's what we are doing, and I completely agree with the analysis you've just offered there regarding the outlook uh, for European entrepreneurs. If I look at how we are doing with our share of patents in different very important parts of the global economy, and if I look at the entrepreneurs that I meet in Ireland alone, uh, their ambition, their innovation, you'll be very familiar with Stripe, of course, you've invested in. At the seed stage, we were the uh, first investor. You're one of the first supporters. And now a globally successful company with peers uh, nowhere near that scale yet, but many peers who are as ambitious in Ireland uh, and all over Europe to do that all over again. But it's precisely because now the appetite is there in the European economy for that kind of innovation where the lead is able to do it. The question then becomes... How can Europe itself play a role in providing the savings and the capital to contribute to that and obviously, ultimately, to benefit from it as well? And uh, to build on your point, it's about making sure the money is there to follow the opportunity and not just, which while of course we hugely welcome it, uh, money coming in from other parts of the world which play the role in European companies growing to the scale they are. So it's because of that practical opportunity and need that we're all now devoting time to how we can make it happen. God knows it will take time, mm -hmm. but in Europe, uh, we do move slowly at times, mm -hmm. but we move carefully over years and look back at the huge progress we've made. And that's what we need to do here now. Except occasionally in the middle of a crisis where you move really dramatically in a single night. And, and, a... and of course, what's <laughs> particularly challenging about this uh, opportunity rather than a crisis is it's an opportunity that moves gradually, and then you look at the huge change that's happened in the European economy that other parts of the world have helped play a role in funding. And uh, we just want to add to that by European savings playing a role. So, Christine Lagarde, concretely, what are the steps that could be taken in potentially a shorter time frame without putting mm. the whole edifice mm. in place? I would argue that we don't have time to be slow this, this time around because the climate transition is an imperative and has to move fast. So can we afford Pascal is right. We tend to move slowly, but surely accept. And I think we are in an accept case where it's not a crisis, but it's massive investment that is needed. So I, I have a, a slightly provocative view, probably, but that's because I have tried to help, you know, using the bottom-up approach, trying to... Uh, pick the low-hanging fruit, move one little initiative at a time in the hope that it will eventually work. I, I recently uh, gave a speech, a speech in Frankfurt, and being in Frankfurt, I advocated that we needed to uh, use a Kantian shift and move from this bottom-up approach that we, we have adopted for the last 15 years to a top-down approach. And for that, I, I, have, I have three practical suggestions. That's what you've asked me to mm -hmm. focus on. The first one is to have a single set of rules that would apply to the capital markets across the European Union so that the regulatory authorities, and I'll come to that in a second, applies the same rules throughout the European Union. The second that we need, you know, why is the US market strong? It's notably because the SEC is pretty powerful and can actually implement and deliver on the single set of rules throughout the United States. Well, if we had an ESMA, or we can call it a different name if we're not happy with the name, but that had the similar authority as SEC, it would certainly also make a dent in that very slow and gradual process. 
And the third, I think the uh, infrastructure, uh, the, the trade infrastructure providers, uh, it's one area where we do a lot better than the US. In the US, they have five times more venture capital than we do. We have 20, 20 trade <laughs> infrastructure providers when the US has one. This is not a good idea. <laughs> we need to have a much more consolidated trade infrastructure mechanism in place. And I, where I say, and then I, I will not take any, any more minute of your time, Stephanie. When I say that artificial intelligence can help, I believe that it's not a question of eliminating the marketplace that Frankfurt, Paris, Madrid, Milan, and Dublin can constitute eventually, but to bring them under one single mechanism, one single set of rules, one single regulator. And we have been able to do that in banking supervision with the SSM, where the local authorities in the various member states still enjoy a level of control and authority and conduct joint supervision with the SSM. It is doable without destroying the turf and the territories that are fiercely defended in many corners of Europe. Well, talking, OK, so starting with Dublin, maybe. Uh, what Has the Eurogroup talked about Madame Lagarde's excellent proposals? Are you going to sign up? Uh, we, have, we, we will be talking about them in our February and March meetings. This, it's November, she said this. Talk about... Uh, well, uh, could you well, not have just had a phone call after she... Well, we, have, talk we, we, we talk all the time, but actually the reason why uh, we've been doing this is we've actually been bringing into our Eurogroup meetings businesses who depend on private capital to get their view of what's happening in Europe. So we've been bringing in the private sector, we've been bringing in so-called market participants to hear what they think. So what do you think you're going to say when you meet? So I think there are elements of what Christine talked about uh, that are definitely going to be considered, may play a role in us, uh, in where we end up. If I was to pick out the two things that have surprised me the most and what I've learned the most from all of the discussions that we've been in, I've been really interested in how the development of national pension systems in different countries have played such a decisive role in increasing the volume of capital that is available to invest within companies. And uh, we're starting doing that in Ireland, but there are other countries now that are well down the path that can relate the development of their pension systems now to economic growth and investment. And that's been a very interesting insight that has came out across a variety of different countries. Uh, the second issue that has been, I think, new to the debate so far is it's not just about the integration across capital markets. It's the fact that many countries want to grow the depth of their own national capital markets at the moment and recognise that they're really underdeveloped. Um, and by doing that, and looking at how we can integrate as we do it, it again creates the ability to add volume. And just in, you know, in reference to Ireland, while of course I'm speaking as president of the Eurogroup here, rather than as a member of the Irish government, of course we're always eager to look at ways in which the single market can be deepened and completed, because we want to play a role then in playing that, in that arena um, uh, to grow financial services and in turn allow them to invest into the real economy. Christian, I guess I'd be interested in what you think the reaction in Germany might be to, to, to these proposals. But actually also, you've often, you know, in, in these conversations, we often talk about you know, bemoaning the lack of a European banking champion. And I just wondered whether there's an, you know, if you think of all the obstacles to having a, a big European banking champion, is it the kind of things that we're talking about? Or is it something a bit more kind of cultural? Well, I, I would say, I mean, this is even a little bit different from, from the European capital markets, but I get back to your point on the, on the European uh, banking champion. By the way, I think you can't create a banking champion uh, just by forcing um, the institutions to do that. That, that. The market needs to want it, and you need to have certain preconditions. By the way, in this regard, the capital markets union is not the predominant precondition. It's actually the banking union which needs to be finalized. Um, for us, if, if we think about um, uh, more consolidation in Europe, uh, one of the precondition is that from a regulation point of view, um, uh, 
from a framework point of view, we, we actually finalized the last bit of the banking union. Um, I think that is one very important point. I think there is another point, of, and I'm really glad about the argument which came that next to the capital markets union, the first step in order to make it better is to develop the national capital markets. And, and I can say it from a German point of view. The German capital markets is actually not as deep as the Swedish ones, as um, some other Scandinavians ones. And actually, we, can, we could learn a lot from, from these countries in order to develop the national capital markets as a first step, actually, to get to a capital markets union. So I think we also need to make the, the plea also to the politicians that they should not only focus on the capital markets union, but also work on the domestic scheme. That's number one. Number two, a very pragmatic first step to bridge into capital markets union. Even if everybody who has to say a lot and has the power to do something, it will take another three, four, five years to get there where we want to. Sure. We need secretarizations. We need to actually bridge the time to create capacity. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the, uh, um, the proposal done by Bruno Le Maire and, and Christian Lindner to think about making secretarizations in Europe simpler to think about what kind of regulations can we also make a bit more light compared to the US ones, that would help a lot actually to free up our banking balance sheets in order to give new capacity into the economy. So one of the proposals we are doing from a European banking association is always saying, we know how difficult it is to get to the uh, capital markets union, but let's think about the pragmatic steps to there. Secretarization could do a lot. We have one tenth of the volume, of the US volume in secretarizations in Europe. <coughs> and that is simply not enough in order to create the capacity on the banking balance sheets. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Rolof, I wanted to ask you, because you know, the, in different ways we're talking about whether there are also other aspects of the European <coughs> environment which could be just as effect, just uh, could affect the opportunities as much as some of the things that we're discussing. You're obviously um, very involved with AI and open AI and, and other parts of that community. Um, something like the EU AI Safety Act, which has obviously been a big focus of attention in Europe and elsewhere, is that going to be good or bad from the, from the, does it look like it will be good or bad for startups and investment in AI in Europe? Not yet. <laughs> I think regulation is necessary with any powerful technology. You know, any technology can be used for good or bad. I think generally regulation is uh, especially advised at an application layer to make sure that you don't have discriminatory lending practices, for example, or that it isn't misused in healthcare. So I think at the application layer, and there are lots of very good regulations for that already. I would say be careful, I mean, my, what do I know about regulation, but I'd be careful in the early stages to make sure that we don't accidentally snuff out the innovation because there's tremendous innovation happening here in Europe. Based on our analysis, Europe has a much higher density of AI talent than the United States. And the number of master's, and PH, master's degree and PhD uh, AI researchers in Europe is far greater than what we have. And a company like Mistral in France is a fabulous example. Fabulous founders coming up with wonderful innovation. They're far more capital efficient than some of the competitors in, in the United States. I would hate to... Um, smother a young company that's blossoming like that. But is, are you worried that they, the act as, as written or as, as, no. as designed will do that? Uh, as written, the act is, has no problem whatsoever. I just think in general, it's the same, same conversations we're having in the United States, is it, it's such an emergent technology, there's a risk that one accidentally prevents innovation that we have not yet seen. And, you know, it may be better sometimes to follow very quickly with abuse that one sees rather than imagining all the things that can go wrong and preventing something from flourishing. So that's the, the only observation. I mean, this has the potential, maybe in general this week at Davos, I've heard a lot of people express concern about the risks of AI, and I'm much more focused on the potential of AI to really transform society. I, I listen to companies every week across every single industry, and I see transformation in education, in healthcare, in productivity, in security. Everywhere there is opportunity for red productivity. So I think we should harness that. Mm -hmm. Nadia Calvino, I was going to ask you, I mean, further, further to that, but just generally thinking about, I mean, there is a sense, I think of all the things that, the Europe, that Europe is facing and all the challenges for the European economy and how countries adjust to their models and things like, a lot, a plethora of new national subsidies for different industries, thinking about competing with China and elsewhere. 
Is it just that this is not necessarily the biggest problem, the biggest obstacle facing Europe? And do you think that there are other things, Enrico Letta has, has actually singled out other things that are going wrong with the single market. Should we focus on those? Well, it's very difficult to see because there's so many challenges that we're confronted with right now and they have to do indeed with the climate change. It has, they have to do with technologies and, and asymmetries of information also, you know, from a perspective of a regulator. I was until December actually responsible for the AI Act under the Spanish presidency and leading the negotiations that, that drove and that allowed us to have this agreement on the Act. And I know how difficult it is to react to something as complex as artificial intelligence and react promptly in a manner that really avoids that the risks materialize, you know? And there is a clear asymmetry between the expertise and the knowledge of the companies that are running and, and creating the algorithms and any supervisor, you know? If there's a symmetry when we're talking about financial uh, supervision, imagine when we're talking about AI supervision, you know, from the public sector. And there is a duty to protect citizens. So there are so many uh, things going on. What I and, and I, I, I would like to uh, think, I, I was very taken by this idea that we need to make Europe the land of opportunity, you know, which is a, which is a very inspiring thought. And I think in many, in many instances, and despite the challenges and the limitations and the absence of an internal market <coughs> in banking, in capital markets, in, in, in energy, in so many areas, actually the EU has become the standard setter in data protection. And when we adopted the GDPR, I remember people saying this is going to be the end of the world as we know it and no innovation and actually uh, it has become the standard. I think we uh, can become the uh, global standard on the taxonomy and that's green investments and green bonds. So there are many areas where Europe can and, and will, I think, lead processes. Um, and, and just to, to wrap up on, on where Christine was, I think it's a no-brainer that we would need a single rule book, a single supervisor, and a, you know, that, that would be, uh, that's exactly what we thought in 2014. That is what a capital market union, from a, from a regulatory point of view, would look like and you would have to focus on. And because we have not been able to reach that, there have been many different initiatives and bottom-up and, and uh, smaller changes, or not so small, like the anti-money laundering regulation, which we're also making progress on. But we don't really uh, um, manage to uh, close the ABC that, that Pascal was, was mentioning. So that, I think, is leading me uh, as a very, to a more pragmatic approach in the sense of thinking, okay, let's focus on securitization or green bonds or climate finance or uh, artificial intelligence uh, financing or scaling up of startups and let's build from the reality on the ground in parallel to trying to make progress on building a regulatory framework that, that reflects the single capital markets that we should have. And that probably that approach is necessary in many other areas because indeed there are many shortcomings and there is a difficulty to uh, reaching uh, unanimous or qualified majority agreements in Europe in, in many core areas, uh, maybe because of the maturity of our markets and the maturity of our economies, which makes it more difficult to build from scratch, you know, uh, maybe than in, in some other areas of the world where maybe the, it's easier to leapfrog or to build uh, new paradigms um, okay. starting on a, on a white sheet of paper. Well, one of the things we haven't mentioned, there's only a few minutes left, but we haven't mentioned what has happened since 2014 is Europe has actually lost its deepest, most mature capital market in the UK. London. Now, I can understand, yes, London, not the UK. <clears throat> uh, Sequoia, where is your European headquarters? London. <laughs> <laughs> So you talked, you talked about having a European team on the ground, but they all then come home to London. Is that about right? But they're French, German, Swiss, but they live <laughs> Romanian. <laughs> they spend all their time on the ground in Europe. Okay. Can I go back to the institutional investment? Uh, yeah, briefly. But I, I do want to sort of make a challenge just, around. Just one okay. observation. In, in the United States, most of the risk capital that finances venture and growth stage companies comes from endowments, foundations, nonprofits, pension funds. And it is interesting that even in the UK, it's more likely for a Canadian pension fund to invest in late stage than UK pension funds because the rules have made it very hard for them. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what the phenomenon is in Europe, but it's just interesting to me. I don't know if that kind of a 
private risk capital market exists here. I just don't know, but it is what we have in the United States. And that is actually something that, that the British government are also trying to focus on, and it's a very clear yes. gap. But I just wonder, I know you're all going to say I'm mad, but I mean, isn't there, if it's going to be so slow to have the full European approach to developing a capital <laughs> market union, would there be a way that you could at least have make progress by reconnecting in some way, even in a, even in a very partial way, to the, to the very well-developed deep capital market that Europe already has in London? Is that not even worth thinking about? Taking advantage of the strength that already exists rather than trying to create things out of scratch? Pascal, you're just looking at me very <laughs> coolly. <laughs> uh, <I've> <laughs> I'm not talking about letting them in or anything. I'm just saying, you know, is there a way to... Because they were the greatest force behind some of this from in, the, in the old days. Well, I mean, the United... London uh, has been an anchor of uh, the availability of global capital. And uh, I don't think it was ever uh, likely uh, that their exit from the European Union, as much as I regret that happening... Uh, was going to have a very, very instant effect on their scale and what they can do. Uh, but for me, I don't uh, respectfully accept the premise that it is inevitable that progress that we're going to make on capital markets in the time ahead will be slow. I don't accept that premise. Uh, finance ministers at the moment and prime ministers are deeply seized with the reality that we have to fund so much change and the taxpayer and European institutions on their own can only supply a fraction of that resource. A large fraction, but a fraction. And the gravity of that is very, very clear to us. There may well be, and the private sector dictates it anyway, forms of cooperation that will continue to take place uh, with, the, with London and with the United Kingdom. Uh, but the reality is that the European Union needs to uh, reorganise and deepen our capital markets to fund things that Europeans want to see happen. And I'll just end with a, with a prediction. Um, tomorrow afternoon, uh, I'll be out of my constituency in Dublin Central meeting constituents. I won't meet a single constituent that would be demanding deeper capital markets <laughs> of me. But I'll meet lots of constituents who are going to be, who are deeply concerned about a lot of the changes we've talked about, mm -hmm. feel in their bones the challenge that we have to grow and maintain living standards in the year, ahead, year ahead, while at the same time seeing the brilliance of lots of European companies and entrepreneurs. And the, they want answers regarding how we join up all those dots. And a big part of that answer is the theme that we're all exploring here this afternoon. Should we add that many of these successful companies that Pascal is referring to actually go and get their financing out in the US? <laughs> Which we've heard a demonstration of this afternoon. That is exactly the case. <laughs> so what's the final... We just have, you know, we have one minute left. The, in a year's time, since we're not going slowly <laughs> anymore, um, what is the sort of most concrete form of progress that you would hope, realistically hope, to have achieved on this? I mean, well, Pascal, but also the, the others would, would like to see. So I, I'll kick off with the pension bit, actually. Okay. In my single biggest learning, particularly from looking at the Nordic economies, is the way they have um, uh, uh, presented... So they developed amazing auto-enrolment pension systems with the objective of maintaining income sufficiency for their society in decades to come. They have done it in a way that has delivered an amazing economic benefit to how they can invest in their own future. And if I was to pick one thing uh, that I think can change the direction is uh, more countries within the European Union doing something which they want to do anyway to look after citizens later in life but doing it then in a way that deepens the volume of capital for investment in what we're talking about. Christian? I think a relief to the securitization rules, because it would be an immediate relief to the economy and, and to the banks. And for you, practically, to have on this panel an industry leader um, who actually says that they are not getting the financing which they need, 
So if we finally explain to the people that capital markets is not a wish by the banks, but it's a necessity for the economy, and this is represented by the industry leaders, um, then I think we are a step ahead. Nadia? I think that one year from now, the EIB will continue to be one of the drivers of the green financing uh, framework in Europe. Mm -hmm. We will continue to outperform our targets, above 50% of green investment in our top, top, uh, total numbers. And uh, you know, I, I have launched a project to try to see how we can be more of a catalyst on the liability side, you know, and also to look into this green bond and how to interact with financial markets in a manner which makes our green finance markets, uh, you know, quite relevant when it comes to innovation and and climate change and climate action throughout the world. And uh, Roloff, you said that you're, you were daunted, you're not, you don't envy them their task, but respectfully, would you, what would you say they should put top of their list <laughs> concretely? Well, what I want to do is I want to find the best founders in Europe in the next 12 months and make sure that we help them build global business leaders. That's ah. what I want to do. Ah. Christine Lagarde, you get the last word. You get to pick your, your top. That it is not a topic for another <laughs> panel next year. <laughs> <laughs> And we yeah, have an everyone. action list and we have securitization under underway. Yeah. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much.